All right, so yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, this idea of hard forks versus soft forks, um, which is really a, a general governance issue. Um, how should we go about making changes to the Bitcoin protocol? And it's an issue that's come up specifically in the context of the Stone debate in at least two ways. So first, one of the main arguments, if not arguably the main argument against increasing the block size limit, is this claim that hard forks are dangerous. Um, you know, somewhat less visible is the argument over the SegWit software proposal. And you know, there some people say, well, maybe SegWit does some, some useful things, but the nature of the changes it's making are such that it really shouldn't be done as a soft fork. So here we have what I would call the typical small blocker view of hard forks versus soft forks. Um, so they would claim that hard forks are dangerous, they risk breaking consensus and splitting the network. They should be used rarely, if ever, and only with extreme safeguards, such as strong consensus. And apparently, the magic number there is 95% hash power support. And supporters of this people say things like controversial hard force cannot happen. Um, on the other hand, they will uh, they view soft forks as these, comparatively speaking, safer than hard force and thus think that they should be the preferred method for making changes to the consensus protocol. And so it's my position that basically everything about that viewpoint is wrong, and that in fact, hard forks are not dangerous, they are actually safer than soft forks and should generally be preferred over soft forks. So I want to make two arguments um, for that position. One is that hard forks avoid unnecessary and inherently dangerous complexity. Two uh, is that hard forks facilitate user and market choice, whereas soft forks undermine user and market choice. So I should probably briefly go over what is meant by these terms. So a hard fork involves uh, removing or loosening a consensus rule. So something that was previously considered invalid is now allowed. And a soft fork is basically the opposite. You're adding a new rule or you're tightening an existing rule. So something that was previously considered valid is now no longer permitted. So hard fork, you expand the universe of what's permitted. Soft fork, you retract the universe of what's permitted. And of course, you can have changes that combine both hard and soft fork elements where uh, you know, the change is more permissive in some ways and more restrictive in others. All right, so do not try and fork Bitcoin instead of only try to realize the truth, there is no fork. And you'll see that it's not Bitcoin that forks, it's only yourself. So, what do I mean by that? Well, um, there's this concept of validity in Bitcoin, and one of the points I want to make is that validity is always subjective, right? That's just inherent in Bitcoin's nature as a decentralized system with no official you know, central controlling authority. Everybody, by definition, gets to decide for themselves what is valid, what the real rules are, because they can choose what software to run and which version of the ledger to value. Now, as a practical matter, of course, you've got you know really strong incentives to accept as valid the blocks, the transaction that you anticipate that other people will uh, accept as valid. Right? I mean, the overwhelming importance of the network effect means that you generally want to align yourself with the network high line, with the market high line. Um, but even here, you know, the opinion of the, the network high line can change, right? So how do you bend the spoon in the matrix? Well, you realize that there is no spoon. You shift your perception of the spoon and bend yourself. How do you bend or fork the Bitcoin network? You realize that there are no fixed, immutable consensus rules, you shift your perception, and you're hopefully talking about a widely shared shift in perception as far as what the consensus rules are. So here's a hypothetical that I think makes that idea a little bit more concrete. So um, imagine that our Satoshi's estimated to hold about 1 million bitcoins. Okay, so let's say that he reserves this tomorrow and broadcasts publishes this transaction where he's sending 900,000 Bitcoin to the one Bitcoin eater address, you know, burn them, 
um, and he's including a 100,000 Bitcoin miner fee. But there's a catch, right? This is a lot of, this is going to be a lot of inputs. And somebody gave me an estimate that you know, 20,000 inputs, this is going to be about two and a half megabytes. So you know, the question is, how does the market react to this scenario? Do miners just go, well, gee, I, I would like an extra $60 million. <laughs> unfortunately, any, any block I mine this into is going to be projected as a value. And I think the answer is no. I mean, I think, I think it's not hard to see why this would very likely precipitate a shift in the market's conception of what is valid, right? I mean, A, you've got miners who would be very eager to share in, um, this miner fee, and there would be this huge deflationary benefit to burning that many coins and you know some people you know removing what some people see is the, the looming presence of you know, Satoshi's huge stash. Oh, what, if he, what if he appears tomorrow and you know dumps them on the market. So um, and finally you have sort of this implicit endorsement by you know ultimate Bitcoin authority. Satoshi's essentially saying hey I think we should raise the limit. So you know the point is that I think this would precipitate a shift in you know what the what the rules are. All right, so now let's look at some example course. These are stock types. But so um, here's a blockchain, right? We've got blocks 97 through 99. And the current consensus rules are that the blocks must be blue rectangles. And let's say that you decide that if you really want this to make blocks that are orange hexagons. How do you do that? Well it's it's a hard work, it's pretty easy, right? Because you just as a certain block height, you start enforcing this new rule set. And one thing to note is that hard forks um, are sort of inherently transparent, right? Even if you didn't know a hard fork was coming, if you, you're a miner and you see, hey, people are building on this chain with orange hexagon blocks, you know that at least from the perspective of those miners, the rules have changed and you have, uh, you have a choice to make, right? All right, now we're going to talk about uh, soft forks. So, uh, I think there are sort of two kinds of soft forks. There are what I would call natural soft forks where the nature of the change you're making actually lends itself naturally to implementation via the software. And then you have your hacks where the functional nature of the change does not lend itself to implementation as a, as a software, necessitating some kind of hack. Um, so we should have natural soft forks. Again, the current rules are blue rectangles, but you want to make squares in the new requirement. So, you know, you can do that pretty easily, but, you know, one thing to note is that um, it's not inherently transparent. Like, conceivably, a majority of the hash power could deploy a software. And if you're a miner that's not in the loop, maybe you try to mine a, you know, non-square rectangular block, and it's going to be working. And well, I'm not sure is that just bad luck. But if it keeps happening, or if you look at the blockchain and see, well, gee, the last you know, 50 blocks have all been squares, it's probably not a coincidence. Maybe the rules have changed. All right, so here's an example of a hack. So again, blue rectangles, current rules. Now we want to, again, as in the, the hard work example, we want to make the rule be the blocks must be orange hexagons. Well, it's easy to do as a hard work because that's what it really is. What we're really trying to do is to allow something that wasn't previously allowed. The question is, is there a way to do this with a software? And the answer is yes. Um, so what you can do is you can basically, you have to keep the current rule set. So you have to keep the rule, the existing rule that blocks must be blue rectangles. But what you can do is you can basically add a new rule that says a valid block must include at some you know, predetermined location, essentially a pointer to an extension block. And you can have all of the real action vis-a-vis -vis updating ledger happening in the extension block. And um, if you can apply whatever rule set you want to the you can say, well, the extension block has to be launch next time. And so, you know, it's sort of this invasion of the block snatcher scenario where the, the main blocks become um, you know, sort of pod person blocks that still look valid to old nodes, but their actual the actual internal operation is totally Alien. So, you know, the non upgraded nodes now have no idea what's actually going on in the real blockchain, which is essentially now happening in the extension blocks. So, 
you know, people say, well, isn't it great the way that softwares don't kick old nodes off the network? You know, my response is that, well, you know, of course they're kicking off the network. They just don't necessarily know it. But you know, even in a less extreme example, by definition, um, a software means that non-upgraded nodes are no longer full nodes. They're no longer fully validating because <coughs> they can't fully validate because they don't have the complete rule set. Um, and this is, you know, I don't think it's unfair. This is kind of, in a way, how Segwit works, right? Now, Segwit doesn't completely gut the block, but it does pull out you know, the signature information for segment transactions and basically pass for the point that says, hey, go look over here for the real signature data, but you know, the old nodes don't, don't have any understanding of that. They haven't upgraded. So one point, um, I think this you know, conceptual sort of silly stylized example is that essentially anything that can be done with a hard fork can also be done with a more convoluted software. Um, so now let's uh, think about sort of the cumulative effect of multiple software hacks, right? So now you've done your first software and you decide actually, you know, we don't want orange hexagons, what would really be great is purple octagons. Well, <laughs> <laughs> stay with it. So you're stuck with the current rule set. The current rule set is blocks must be blue rectangles and they must point to orange hexagons. So you have to, you have to keep that in place and you have to add to it. Right, so what do you do? Something like that, right? <laughs> this, is, this is four exceptions, right? It's getting, it's getting out of me. Um, which brings me to the, you know, the first argument, which is that hard force avoid this kind of unnecessary complexity. Right, so what are the problems with complexity? Well, you know, you risk, um, you increase the risk of dangerous bugs slipping through. The code gets more difficult, more bloated, more difficult to understand. You increase the barrier to entry for new developers. And you know, you make every additional upgrade sort of more difficult. And you know, a very simple, concrete way to think about the problem is it's kind of like if you self-impose this constraint where you can only add new rules, but you can never get rid of existing rules. It's kind of like if you can only acquire new things but never throw anything out, right? So I guess you get to that. That's no way to live. <laughs> um, so the second argument is that hard forks facilitate user and market choice, whereas soft forks undermine user and market choice. And the first observation I want to make here is that you know what we think of as the dreaded 51% attack is really just another name for a malicious software, right? So what do we worry about? What are the bad things we worry about an attacker doing if they gain control of the majority of the hash power? Well, they can facilitate double spending. But all that is is, is you know, software, new rule. Actually, transaction B occurred before transaction A, right? Because, I mean, ordering transactions via hash power in the longest valid chain is, is basically the whole purpose of the blockchain. So, you know, facilitating the double spend in that manner, it doesn't violate any consensus software rules. I mean, it's, it violates the social rules of Bitcoin. It's going to be considered an attack. But as far as, you know, known software is concerned, it's Perfectly, uh, perfectly legitimate. Um, another thing they can do is they can prevent transactions from confirming or blacklist addresses. So just add a new rule, right? Transactions from the following addresses are invalid. You can completely shut down all transactions, right? New rule, valid blocks must be completely empty. You can freeze out, <laughs> well, we know this. Yeah, that's what you can do. Um, you can freeze out other miners. New rule, only the blocks that I mine are valid. And you know what makes um, what makes these you know fifty one percent attacks so insidious is that everyone else automatically goes along with them, right? Everyone's software is set up to automatically track the longest valid chain, and the chains you know these kinds of chains produced by an attacker are still valid. And so, in order for the you know the honest members of the network to resist these attacks, which you know of course they would want to do, they have to take affirmative steps. They have to coordinate their own fork um, to change the proof of work or make some other change to try to neutralize the attacker. And the problem is that the coordination problem there is not necessarily trivial. On the other hand, note that we don't really worry about someone acquiring 51% of the hash power and doing something that's obviously malicious with a hard fork, right? If I, if I get you know, 
majority of the hash power, and I start mining blocks with a 10,000 Bitcoin block reward. Well, you know, there's everyone else just ignores me. There's no there's no coordination problem involved in persisting that change. And everyone's going to see that you know, that's a silly value destroying protocol change, and I don't want to go along with that. And they don't have to do anything. Um, and you know, but the funny thing is that this this difference is actually you know the way that the software sort of sweep people along who haven't opted in, who haven't incited firmly to run the new software is actually seen as an advantage of softworks by you know the anti hard fork crowd. And you know they'd say, well, you know, obviously that dynamic is unfortunate in the context of a malicious attack, but we're talking about using softworks for protocol improvements. And if you're making an improvement, isn't it a good thing that you know softworks keep the network together to prevent chain splits? Because can we all agree that chain splits are really bad? And you know my answer is no, right? we, we can't do that. And um, you know, one thing to, to consider is that really we're talking about spectrum, right? So you have your at one end, your unambiguously malicious 51% attack, right? As a software. At the other end, you can imagine a software that is completely non-controversial. Literally everyone is on board. This is an improvement. But you know, in, in the case of an attack, we don't want the software to succeed in keeping the network together on the attacker's chain, right? Obviously, we hope that the network is going to route around the attack. And at the other end of the spectrum, right, it's completely not controversial. Doing it as a software doesn't keep the network together, right? What keeps the network together is the fact that everyone is on board, right? Everybody recognizes that this is an improvement, an improvement, and the network, in fact, is going to keep people incentivized to go with, you know, go with the new rule set. So the interesting case is, is something in the middle, right? Where you've got a change that's controversial. Now, it's not intentionally, obviously malicious, but at least some people think this is a bad idea. This is a value destroying change. And so, at some point, you get you you know you, you go from the right and move left. You get a change that is sufficiently controversial that you have people that would want to resist uh, for. That would say, I don't care that you have a majority of hashware on board. You know, I want to stay behind on, on the old rule set because I think you're making you're making a huge mistake. And in, in those cases, you know, doing doing the protocol change as a soft fork can potentially make a difference in keeping the network together. Because when you do it as a soft fork, you impose this additional uh, coordination cost, and maybe that additional you know, difficulty of the opposition sort of having to coordinate their own fork to, to not be swept along is, is high enough that they are sort of forced to go along and not able to, to you know, mount effective resistance. Well, is that a good thing? And you know, I think the question is, you know, are chain splits bad? Are they always bad? And to me, the answer is clearly no, right? Because they have benefits and they have costs. Well, the costs are some loss of network effect and potential for ecosystem confusion, but there are also benefits, right? More people get to satisfy their preferences with respect to protocol, and you also get uh, the ability to experiment with, with more than one path. So, you know, my prediction is that we should only expect economically meaningful persistent chain splits to occur where the benefits of splitting outweigh the costs. Um, you know, what really, really keeps the network together is the network, right? And an analogy I really like is to think of, you know, Bitcoin as a, um, as a herd of animals or a you know, tribe of people. They're all traveling together, right? And they're all free as individuals to go wherever they want, but there are huge benefits to sticking together, right? The bigger the herd, the more protection against predators, about people, there's more opportunities for specialization of labor and trade, and um, uh, you know, so so there may be disagreements. Like just if you, have, if you have a huge group of individuals, um, they recognize, hey, staying together is, is in our best interest ordinarily, but they're not necessarily going to agree on, on which direction to go in. Um, and the easiest path when there's sort of disagreement is, is, is the current path, right? So this, this, the status quo is always a strong showing point. But when enough people 
feel strongly enough that no, we need to make a change and can coordinate move, they're likely to switch direction, right? They're likely to say, actually, we're not going to keep going the same direction. We're going this way. We're going to, we're going to fork off. And so the question is, imagine that 60, 60 people, and if we have a group of 100, 60 people say, we think this new direction is better, and they, they, they change and they start heading off in that new direction. What is the motivation? What is the likely response of the main 40? Well, you know, the 40, a lot of them might think that not agree with that that's, that's the best course of action. But generally speaking, they're going to value the benefit of being part of a larger group more because the network effect is so important. And so you still start to get people defecting from the smaller group to the larger group. And as that happens, we get the two groups get even more lopsided, right? So you get this very powerful, you know, self-reinforcing feedback loop toward convergence on the new direction. But not always, right? So what if what if there are 20 people in the group who think that no, not only is the majority heading off in uh, a suboptimal direction, but they're actually heading over a cliff, right? Yes, I'd still like to be part of the larger group, but I'm not going to follow them off a the cliff, right? Um, and I think that's a good result, right? And I think that's you know, if, if if you feel so strongly about sort of getting your own way. Um, if you're willing to suffer the accompanying loss of network effect, then that's probably the right result, and that's what you value more. You know, also consider how resilient this makes people. Right? Because what if they're right? Right? What if one group is sort of heading off for a proverbial cliff? Well, if if there's a, a group that doesn't follow them, you know, Bitcoin as a species survives. Right? And not only does it survive, you get this sort of evolutionary survival of fitness because the people who are proved themselves to be best at recognizing the successful path, gain more ability to influence future directions over um, you know, future uh, choices over direction, right? Because if you if you recognize, gee, this group is going in the wrong direction, they're going over a cliff, your incentive is to sell off your stake in the doomed chain for a larger stake in the successful chain, right? And that that, that gives you more economic clout and more ability to influence. You know, future um, future decisions about direction. Uh, another you know way to think about this issue is that fear of hard forks is fear of the market, right? Because you know chain splits can't be a problem because they're trivial. Any one of us could spin up our own hard fork right now and split the network, right? And the response is, oh well, that would be silly, right? I mean, sure you could you could fork off, but no one would value your you know random fork. Which is probably true, but what that tells you is that the real fear of you know chain splits is that they'll be economically significant. So your real fear is that the market will place a non-trivial value on two chains. And you know if you're afraid of the market, then sort of the question is what are you what are you doing to Bitcoin, right? Because Bitcoin is entirely a creature of the market, right? And the market generally, you know, 99.9% of the time is going to recognize that it doesn't make sense. The, the two chains have a non-trivial value is not the way to go, but sometimes it might, right? Um, so we, you know, we obviously know that hard forks can happen, right? Because lots of altcoins are hard. But empirically, we can look at the ecosystem and see that economically meaningful uh, chain splits resulting from hard forks appear to be the exception, and the only significant one I'm aware of is the appearance one. So what can we take away from that example? Well, you know, one thing to note is that this split was the result of what I would call fundamentally irreconcilable differences over ledger integrity. It wasn't a skew, a potentially resolvable dispute over, over protocol features. And I say that a dispute over protocol features is potentially resolvable because you can always add or remove features later, right? The protocol can always be changed. But here you have, you know, a, 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 a fundamentally you know, irreconcilable dispute over the, the integrity of the, the ledger. And you know, from the, the, the perspective of the Ethereum Classic supporters who, who didn't go along with the fork, you know, they they view the fork as sort of going over the cliff, right? They said they, you know, Ethereum's entire value proposition was supposed to be code as law. Um, you can't just roll back transactions just because 
you know, this smart contract was sloppily coded and investors didn't do their diligence to understand what it did. Um, and you know, the other side of that, is the pro force side can say, well, you know, this was this was a unique set of circumstances. We're still really in beta, and come on, this was a clear bug, right? Obviously, the uh, exploit you know here was not the intended functionality of the um, last slide. It's not the intended functionality of the uh, contract. And finally, this is a really big screw up, right? I mean, this is we're talking about a significant chunk of this, the money supply ending up in the hands of you know someone who should really be considered an attacker. You know, the point is not, you know, I think neither of those, I mean, both of those perspectives have some merit. I mean, either position is crazy. But the point is they're fundamentally irreconcilable. And so I think, you know, to me, a split is a healthy way for that to play itself out. And, and you know, maybe most likely in most cases, one of them will ultimately prevail just because the network effect is so strong. But you know, let's let the market, you know, do its thing. Um, and you know, another thing to observe is that following the fork, the combined market cap of the two chains actually increased, right? Which would seem to support the idea that these kinds of splits will only happen when the benefits outweigh the risk. Because I mean, if you're if you are a holder, you appear to benefit, right? Because now you have you have um, you know, more total wealth at your disposal. Um, you know, there was some disruption in the ecosystem, right? There were some replay attacks and some exchanges that weren't set up properly to handle the situation lost in funds, but there was nothing catastrophic. And you know, finally, we should expect the ecosystem to get better at working, right? As exchanges, wallets, you know, sort of learn how to deal with the issues that these kinds of splits create, we should expect them to get better at handling them in a, in a smooth and you know, safe manner. Um, so that is all I have. I think we have time for one or two questions, if anybody has them. I've got one. Um, you argue that soft forks are harmful. Mm -hmm. So for someone who's not a miner, is there anything they can do to protect themselves against those harms? I mean, I don't see. My position is really less that soft forks are harmful than it is to argue that hard forks are harmful. I think potentially soft forks are harmful, right? I mean, if I saw a clear attack, that's intending to harm Bitcoin. But I think the point I make is that even if you're convinced that this change I want to make is really better, right? So you still don't necessarily want to do it as a software. You don't want to try and ram through to drag people along with you over their opposition. And in fact, if you're really convinced that your change is, is an improvement um, and you have the hash power support on board, what, do you have, what are you afraid of? Because anybody, you should expect that anybody who tries to stay behind on the minority hash power um, chain is going to lose, right? And great, you can take their money, right? Because you, great, you'll, you'll end up with you know, a balance on the minority chain that you can sell off. And you know, you're sort of, there's nothing to be afraid of, right? Does that answer your question? Sure. Okay. Uh, okay, John. 